right. Praise the Lord. Good morning. Hallelujah. Glory. Good morning. Good morning. Hallelujah. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. Well, good morning, everyone. This is Prophet Christopher J. Fitzgerald uh, and uh, coming live from Smyrna, Georgia, here right outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, today, I want to come on the air today on using this platform of Facebook Live to uh, teach a new series um, in dealing with the issue of eternal life. Uh, some call it eternal security. Uh, I'm entitling this uh, series as uh, The Security of Eternal Life According to the Scripture. Uh, the Security of Eternal Life According to the Scripture. I'm dealing with, uh, I'll be dealing with different facets of eternal life, uh, salvation as you have it, as you call it. And um, <clears throat> uh, I think it's going to be really profound. I think it's needed right now uh, in a lot of ways, like never before. Uh, good morning, Pastor Jan. God bless you. <clears throat> good morning to those of you that are joining me this morning. God bless you. So I'm going to be teaching about eternal life. And uh, and so, hey, I hope you be able to go along with me for the ride. So let me just caution you on this particular teaching is that I really do need your patience with me because, and I'm probably going to ask for that again, um, because I'm going to deal with this. I'm going to try to deal with this very methodically. Uh, and uh, some of the points that I may make, you may disagree with me initially, or you may question uh, what I'm saying. But I'm going to ask you to please be patient with me. Uh, I promise you I'm going to cover uh, many, many areas, a plethora of areas that probably is going to address many questions or many uh, foregone conclusions, errors, et cetera, et cetera, that I believe that need to be addressed. And, uh, and I believe in doing so, amen, praise God, uh, you're going to be blessed by it. So uh, I just ask for your patience as you allow me to work through the whole teaching, amen, praise God. I'm not going to finish it all today. This is a series. Uh, and uh, I promise you that in the midst of this series, at some point in this series, I'm going to deal with every, probably every scripture or every category of scripture that people have brought up uh, dealing with the issue of salvation and can you lose it and all these kind of things. So I'm going to do that, okay? So just bear with me. That being said, let's pray and let's get ready to go into this teaching on this morning and then uh, we'll we'll continue to do that. But uh, I, I, again, I beg your indulgence, amen, praise God, just give me a complete listening to, I, I promise you, you're going to be blessed by it. You're going to learn some things. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we give you praise and we give you glory and we give you honor today for your holy word. For we know, Father God, that the truth is in your word. And Father, we ask you right now, God, to give us eyes to see and ears to hear and understanding. Help us to be able to comprehend. Help us to be able to be enlightened by your spirit in the name of your son, Jesus, uh, so that we can take your holy word and handle your holy word um, in a manner that is befitting uh, of the nature of what it is. Because your word declares that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was and the word is you. And so, Father, we pray that if you allow us to handle this word of God, even this word that became flesh and dwelt among us, Allow us to handle this word with your Holy Spirit leading us and guiding us and strengthening us so that we will do um, uh, operate with your word correctly, that we will rightly divide your word in the name of Jesus. And I pray that as we rightly divide your word, that, Father, you will help us with our shortcomings, help us with our weaknesses, our frailties, our ignorances, uh, help us, God, with our lack of understanding, uh, what we lack of. Uh, Whatever we lack, Father God, fix our visions or whatever the case may be. And Father, we give you praise for doing it. God, we thank you right now for bringing peace to the United States of America. Uh, we thank you right now, God, for peaceful trans, uh, trans, uh, a peaceful trans, um, a peaceful transfer of power in our country. We thank you, Father God, for many people that participated in the democracy pro in the democratic process. And now we pray for the peaceful transferring of power on every level, on every in every branch of government on every level of government and every level of leadership, we pray for that. And we pray also, God, that you would allow us, God, to find relief and reprieve 
and our victory over COVID-19. We need that, Father. We need that victory over this. Now, Lord God, again, let this truth go out and let it bless and let it strengthen in Jesus' name. And we give you praise and we give you glory for it. Amen and amen. Again, good morning, Sunday morning here in Smyrna, Georgia, right outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Christopher J. Fitzgerald here, prophet of God. Amen, praise God. And uh, I believe that the word of God speaks for itself. I believe it's prophetic all by itself. And so if I can just preach and teach this word, I do well. So we thank God for that. So let's get into the teaching on this morning. Again, we're dealing with the issue of security of eternal life, uh, the security of eternal life according to the scripture. <clears throat> so I put this out on Facebook some time ago, and um, uh, and uh, the, it actually reminded me today. Actually, the day I was giving it a teaching, it popped back up on my on my uh, on my on my uh, Facebook. Uh, eternal life is the ultimate benefit of the promises of God. Nothing should suppress or surpass eternal life. Whatever comes or whatever goes next, the glory of eternal life causes all else to pale in comparison. Now, I hope you're able to say amen to that. There is nothing, nothing, nothing more important than you knowing and understanding the issue of life eternal, eternal life or eternal security or and whatever other terms you use to describe, amen, praise God, what, we're talk, what I'm talking about this morning. The Bible asks the question, it says, uh, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Uh, the Bible says, uh, what profit a man to gain the whole world and then lose his soul? The Bible also says, amen, praise God, that we are looking for the end of our faith, and the end of our faith is salvation. Glory to God. All of these scriptures, amen, praise God, lets us understand the importance of this idea of salvation that's been given to us by God Almighty himself. Amen, praise God. This is not a man-made issue. This is not a man-made man construct of any type uh, of, of any way, even though men have uh, done things to uh, hurt the, uh, try to hurt the plan of salvation, or man has caused a lot of confusion concerning salvation, but salvation in and of itself is not a man-made construct. It is something that was given to us by God. Amen, praise God. And it's something that we should be very, very, very familiar with. Um, and in fact, it is the most important of, uh, I believe that when you look at the scripture, when you really compare uh, what you can and what you cannot, amen, praise God, nothing is more important, as I said in the statement in eternal life. Everything that we do in this present world, uh, Peter told us that everything that we do in this present world, or this present world, he said it's going to burn with a fervent heat. He says, since all of this is going to happen, he asked the question, what kind of people should we be? What, we should, what should we be about? What should be uh, our driving force? What should be our driving, our drive? I mean, that's what he's asking us. <clears throat> so, so therefore, I wanted to teach on this particular subject today. I, I just finished another series on a different topic, but, but then this kind of resonated with me, and I said I want to teach on this next. So what is eternal security or eternal life? What is eternal security or eternal life? Now, I'm going to give you like the previous statement, amen, praise God, I, uh, that statement was made by me, and I'm going to give you a working definition here of what is eternal security slash or what is eternal life, amen, praise God, and I, I pray that it bless you, I pray that it helps to um, uh, help you understand what eternal life is, but also it's going to serve as, uh, this, this working definition is also going to serve as a introduction as to how many things that we're going to talk about. Amen. Praise God. Doing this series. Uh, so I want you to know that this series is probably going to be at least, it's probably going to be at least 10 parts long, uh, but it may be longer. Amen. Praise God. So I need for you to bear with me as we go through these parts. Amen. Several parts, because I really do want to make it plain to you concerning salvation. Okay. All right. Praise God. All right. And by the way, if you know someone who, who just got saved uh, or you know someone who's, who, who, who's been leaning toward getting saved, um, if you know someone that's confused, whether they don't know if they're saved or not, uh, invite them. Go ahead and take a moment right now, if you would, and share this broadcast with them. Invite them. And, and tell them, say, look, I love you, and because I love you, because I care for you, I want you to hear this, because I promise you, I'm not going to, with the things I'm going to say in this in this teaching, amen, praise God, you're going to be glad that you shared it with someone that was struggling. I, I promise you that. Amen. If not, Amen. As always, you can always email me at profitfits at gmail.com. That's profitfits at gmail.com. 
or you can message me in Messenger. I promise you I won't duck. I won't hide. Amen. Praise God. Questions, challenges whatsoever. Amen. Praise God. I will respond to you in love. Amen. Praise God. I promise you with the scripture and in love. I promise you that. Amen. Praise God. All right. So let's go into this. Let's go into this. So what is eternal security or eternal life? This is what I wrote. Eternal security or eternal life or eternal salvation, uh, often referred to as salvation, uh, occurs when a person is regenerated once and for all by the Spirit of God as a sovereign act of God through faith in Jesus as the Son of God and only Savior for men. This eternal security, also known as eternal life, is not a work of man's own doing from beginning nor throughout, but rather a divine operation of the Godhead. That's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They are the ones that perform the work of eternal life, eternal security, uh, eternal salvation, or also known as just simply salvation. And that's what we're going to be teaching from. So let me read that to you again. Eternal security, uh, eternal security, eternal life, eternal salvation, often referred to as salvation, salvation occurs when a person is regenerated once and for all by the Spirit of God as a sovereign act of God through faith in Jesus as the Son of God and only Savior for men. This eternal security, also known as eternal life, is not a work of man's own doing from beginning nor throughout, but rather a divine operation of the Godhead. All right. Praise the Lord. All right. Remember, you can email me or in, mess in Messenger or email me at prophetfits at gmail.com. All right. Salvation. All right. Salvation. Um, I want y'all to know that I'm, I'm grateful for so many people that have helped me in my understanding of the scripture. And uh, I can't even name them all. So, but, uh, but I thank God for the, the things that God allowed me to study. And, and I appreciate the people that have written so many wonderful things about uh, the Bible that have been very, very helpful for me. Um, and I trust, amen, praise God, that you are fellowshipping with uh, trusted writers and commentators of the scripture as well. So number one, number one, salvation is done by an act of God. Of uh, Salvation is done by an act of the Godhead and cannot be redone or undone once it is done, okay? Salvation is done by an act of the Godhead and cannot be redone or undone once it is done. Look with me, if you would, John 3, chapter uh, John chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. John 3, John 3, uh, verses 14 uh, through 16. Glory to God. John 3, verse 14 through 16. And this, and you'll find this written. Let me. John 3, 14 through 16. It says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, the whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm going to read verse 17 as well. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, on right as we begin talking about salvation and eternal life, I want you to understand, uh, make no bones about it, that I believe that once a person gets saved, they can never lose their salvation. I believe that's what the Bible teaches. I believe that salvation is a once, it's done only once, it cannot be redone, and it cannot be undone. I believe that's what the Bible teaches. And this is what I'm going to prove to you in the scripture. In John chapter 3, verse 14 through 17, that's what we just read, these are foundational scriptures that if they are true, if they are true on their own, then they must be true throughout the whole scripture. If there's any place in scripture where these verses, this particular verse here, is contradicted, then we do not have a salvation that we can depend on. Absolutely not. So it's important that we understand what these verses are saying to us, and it's important that we take these verses at face value, literal face value, and believe them just as they are written, and then allow these clear, 
clean statements about eternal life, let these statements inform everything else we read in the scripture concerning eternal life. Amen. Because if you don't, if you don't, amen, pray God, you're going to, you're going to constantly be going in and out. And so we, that's what we're trying to do here, trying to lay a clean foundation for you. Okay. So first of all, in John chapter three, verse 14 through 16, we see in one that John promised us that it's eternal life, not temporary life. That's the first thing you see here in John chapter three, verses 14 through 17. He's talking about eternal life. In verse 15, he says, whosoever believe it in him should not perish, but have eternal life, not temporary life, but eternal life. Eternal means eternal. Temporary means is here today. It could be gone tomorrow. Temporary means that it's not everlasting. It's not eternal. Amen. Praise God. It's momentary. But the Bible says, if you believe you should not perish, but have eternal life. So he told you two things here by believing. One, if you believe, you don't perish. Two, you have eternal life. Now that's that's two positive, two positive things that he put in his one statement to show you how important this thing is. So it's not temporary, it's eternal. Then he also says everlasting life. Everlasting life. Verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Here we go again, okay? But have everlasting life. So it's everlasting life, not fleeting or flimsy, okay? So this is not a fleeting or flimsy thing that Jesus is sharing with us here, that's been shared with us here in the Holy Word of God, amen? It is saying that if you believe you have something that's everlasting, something that's eternal. Now, either God does not say what he mean and not mean what he say, or God does say what he means and means what he says. I believe that he means what he says and says what he means. And therefore, if I believe, then that means I have eternal life, not temporary life. I have everlasting life, not fleeting life or flimsy life. Glory to God. Now, everything that we're going to read in scripture, everything that I'm going to teach you moving forward is going to agree with this. Nothing in the Bible disagrees with this plain, clearly written text. Nothing. Nothing in the Bible. It is we, amen, praise God, in our own weaknesses and frailties, in our own uh, unbelief, and sometimes being judgmental, and sometimes being impatient, and sometimes being is ignorant, Amen, praise God. We begin to take other verses of scripture throughout the Bible that contradicts and allow those things to begin to contradict this as though salvation can be given, taken back, given again, et cetera, et cetera. Salvation is not that type of fleeting or flimsy thing. It is an everlasting life. It is an eternal life. Glory to God. Amen. So if you have people in your life who don't believe this verse of scripture, you need to understand that because you will have people in your life, and I was one of those at one time, who when I saw somebody doing something or saying something that wasn't right, either I would say it jokingly or I would say it in seriousness, uh, soberness, that I don't know if they say you ain't saved, you ain't, you know, and I'm telling you, amen, praise God, you have to be careful with that because there are people right now who simply do not believe the scripture, amen. And I'm going to say this, sometimes as preachers, sometimes preachers don't believe the scripture. And, and not that they don't, and, and what reason why is because sometimes preachers are so busy trying to get people to conform, trying to get people to conform to be good members of their local church, that they get to a place where they begin to try to go at the person by making the person doubt their, doubt their salvation, trying to get them to obey Amen, praise God, to be obedient or to be more faithful. Now, I realize that they may not mean any harm in doing that, but they are violating the scripture. Glory to God. Amen. You cannot come at me and tell me I'm not saved simply because I'm not doing all the things that you want me to do. Glory to God. You don't have the right or the power or the authority, nor do I, to give and take back eternal life. Glory to God. And it's not something that we should be playing around with like that. Amen, praise God. We shouldn't be trifling with something as important as eternal life. 
especially when people are living in a time where you can slip away at any moment. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You can slip away at any moment. And so this is not a time for you to not to understand for sure. Glory to God. All right. Notice, notice here, believing in Christ produces something immediately. All right. Go to, go to John chapter one, verse 12. Go to John one. Amen. Let's go over to John one, two chapters back and look at verse 12. So notice you got to see believing in Christ produces something immediately. John one in verse 12. It says this, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Do you see the immediacy there? Do you see the immediacy? It did not say to them that believe and then grow and mature. No, it says to them that believe upon his name. He gave them the power to become sons of God. The immediacy there, the immediacy. Everlasting life, eternal life, or salvation as we call it, is not something that God trifles with. He does not, he does not hang it over our head and play with us with it. He don't say, he don't dangle it over and say, oh, you almost got it. Oh, you almost got it. Oh, you gotta be faster. Oh, you gotta be quicker. Oh, you gotta be better. Oh, you gotta be, oh, 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 oh you almost got it. Oh, if you move over here, you'll get it. Oh, if you move over, God don't do that. Not with eternal life, not with salvation. Amen. In fact, God don't do that with anything in the Bible. Glory be to God. Praise his holy name. He doesn't do that with anything in the Bible. But sometimes we, down here in this earth, trying to represent God because we um, we sometimes, uh, in our interactions with one another, and in our poor interpretation and poor handling of the word of God, we misrepresent God. And his plan, amen, praise God, to include this all-important issue of eternal life. But in John chapter 1, verse 12, I'm going to read that to you again. Then I'm going to give you a little note about that. It says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now notice, in John 1 and 12, John 1 and 12 is not a statement of possibility, but rather eventuality. According to all scripture, when looked at appropriately. This is one point where I want to begin to speak to you about how you think. How do you think about God? How do you think about scripture? When you read John 1 12, if you are not careful, you'll read John 1 12 and you'll think that it's saying that, that God, Jesus made it possible for you to be a son of God. And then you'll be thinking, so there's other things that you need to do to be saved. There's other things you need to do, you know, to keep doing, to have this eternal life or to have this salvation. But John 1, 12 is not a statement of possibility. It's rather a statement of eventuality. And so what it's saying is if you believe in Christ, eventually, glory to God, amen, you're going to look just like him. You're going to be as he is. When he comes to rapture the church, you're going to receive a glorified body just like he has. So it's a statement of eventuality. It's not a statement of possibility. Glory to God. And, when I'm, and the reason why I'm making this point to you early, because you got to open up your mind and realize that you're dealing with a God who's faithful. Even in the Old Testament, the writer of the book of Lamentation, he wrote that uh, it's because of his, uh, his faithfulness that we're not consumed that his mercies are new every morning. And that was even back when, in the Old Testament when they didn't have the full revelation of Jesus. Glory to God, amen. They recognized the great mercy and the great faithfulness of God. And what I want you to understand is you have to recognize the great faithfulness and the great mercifulness of God that you're dealing with when it comes down to this issue of salvation and this issue of eternal life. And so you got to start understanding that these statements that you read that can be taken as... If you read them with the Roman, Roman, they could be saying, if it's possible, only if you do the things you're supposed to do. Only if you keep continue to do the things, continue to do. see. And I'm going to show you, and through this series, I'm going to show you all of those type of scriptures that's used that way and show you how you should be reading them so you won't be reading them, uh, you, how you should be reading them according to the mind of God and not according to the mind of man. Glory be to God, all right? 
All right. So, so understand that that statement is a statement of eventuality because you believe on Jesus, because you believe on the son of God, because I believe on the son of God, the Christopher that you see right here on Facebook, one day that son of God named Jesus is going to rapture me, whether I'm asleep or whether I'm alive. And part of the rapture that's going to take place is I'm going to receive a glorified body. That is an eventuality. Not a possibility, but an eventuality because it's a done deal. Because he says, because I believe I have everlasting life. Remember what we read in John 3? What we read in John 3 verses 14 through 17? If, because I believe I have eternal life. Because I believe I have everlasting life. Not fleeting, not flimsy, but everlasting eternal life. So there's no way that John 1 12 is going to be saying something different. Glory to God. All right, look with me at John chapter 4. Go to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, look at verses 13 and 14. John 4, 13, 14. Jesus answered, said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give, give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. There it is again. Not flimsy, not fleeting, everlasting. Glory to God. Okay, go to John chapter 6. Glory to God. John chapter 6, and look at verses 35 and 51. John 6, 35, 51. All right. 35. Hallelujah. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Believe. All right. Look at verse, uh, now look at verse 50, 51. To go along with that. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall, he shall live when? He shall live forever. How long? He shall live forever. That's what it says. Glory to God. All right. And then it says, and the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Did not Jesus give his life for the world? Yes. John 3, 16, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Glory be to God. Did not Jesus do that? Did not the Father do that? Yes, this is not fleeting. This is not flimsy. This is something that's settled. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. So let me give you a few more things about this to break it down. First of all, uh, believing is an act of God on the person. Believing is an act of God. Believe it or not, believing is an act of God on or in that person. But the point I'm trying to make is this. You can't believe without God doing something. So if you believe that Jesus Christ is whom the Bible say he is, and you've confessed that and you're confessing and you believe that in your heart, and it's, and it's the true salvation because, I mean, true faith, true faith originates with God. It does not originate with man. Glory to God. Amen. God does something that causes faith to happen in you. Let me give you a quick testimony. Before I got saved, there were many times when I look back now, I can see that God was pulling me toward him. Amen. It was nothing short of God actually inviting me, bringing me to himself. When I look back, I see times when people tried to talk to me about God and all kind of stuff. You know what I'm saying? I can look back and say, that was God. That was God. That was God. So if you are on here today listening to me, and right now you feel like, man, you know, I want this salvation. I want this eternal life. I want you to understand something. This is not something that just happened today. God has been pulling you and drawing you to this moment for a minute. Amen. Whether it took God a year, whether it took God three years, I don't know how long it was. I don't know how many things God has done. But one thing I do know is that the faith that you are getting ready to exercise in Christ or the faith that you have in Christ you was drawn to that by God. John chapter 14, verse 6. Go to John 14, 6. Come on, John 14, look at verse 6. Glory to God. Jesus said unto him, 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming unto the Father but by me. Glory to God. And he also says to us, amen, praise God, and no one can come unto me except the Father draws him to me. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Praise God. So you see, the way this works is God, God is God is the one that is doing the work. Glory to God. Amen. Not we, but God. Are you understand what I'm saying? Glory to God. So it's important that we understand that 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 what's going on in your life right now is an act of God. God sent Jesus here to do what he did, to do what he did, and even to do what he's doing right now at his own right hand. Amen. And you coming to God is not an issue of uh, uh, coincidence, whether it's an issue, amen, praise God, of a divine act of God. God is actually drawing you to himself, drawing you to Jesus right now. That's what he's doing. Amen, praise God. And even when you get saved, after you get saved, that doesn't stop. It continues through the Holy Spirit. Amen, praise God. The Holy Spirit witnesses to us. He leads us and guides us. Is a continuation. Remember, I said in my opening statement: salvation is salvation is not man's own doing from the beginning nor throughout, but rather is a divine operation of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all involved in salvation. Glory to God. So whether this is your first day of salvation or whether this is your 65th year in salvation, it's still God. Glory be to God. So believing, amen, and coming to God and believing in God, you, you cannot take away that divine operation of the Godhead aspect because that's the only way that it happens in your life, okay? Then we have this issue of by grace and faith. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Ephesians 2, over to God, Ephesians 2, amen, and verses 5 through 8. So it's, it's the issue of grace and faith. And this is important because grace is grace. Lord, that means that it means that you didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. You never will. You never have. You know, a lot of I, I've heard people say things like God saw something in me. Saw something good in me or saw some worth in me uh, to save me. No, no, that's not true. Now, uh, the motive of God saving you has everything to do with bringing him pleasure and bringing him glory and bringing him honor. This I know for a fact, according to the Bible, amen, praise God. But it's not going to be, God didn't save any of us because he saw something good in us worth saving. Now, you can say that God, you know, he, he valued us enough to save us, but it's not because we had any type of inherent good in and of ourselves. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. If there's any value in us, it's because God chose to value us, not because we really do have any value in and of ourselves. Now, I know some people that may be very difficult for them to understand or grasp, but the more you grow in this grace and faith, the more you will be able to agree with that. And when you first get saved, amen, praise God, you may not, all of this may not completely, amen, praise God, be operating in you, but it will. Amen. Praise God. It will, because God always finishes what he starts. <laughs> Praise be to God. He always finishes what he starts. All right. Ephesians chapter two, look at verses five through eight. Amen. Glory to God. In Ephesians chapter two, verses five through eight. I'm going to look at verses four through eight. It says, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us. But it doesn't tell us why God loved us. It just say that God did love us, that he does love us. But it don't tell us why, because there is no why. It's just that God is the God of love. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise him. Now, that's a good place to praise him right there. For his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, had quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. Hallelujah. Then verse 6, and had raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he may show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ. Now, that's probably the closest thing to a why that you're going to find. 
Glory to God. Then verse 8, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So I'm trying to get you to understand that salvation is done by an act of the Godhead and cannot be redone or undone once it is done. Glory to God. It's not temporary life. It's eternal life. It's not fleeting or flimsy life. It's everlasting life. Amen. When you believe in Jesus Christ, it produces something immediately and not just the possibility of becoming, but the eventuality of being what God said you are. Glory to God. Amen. God draws you and he does it by grace and faith. Then we deal with the issue of what we must believe, that, that we must believe the gospel. We must believe the gospel. But remember, even when I say that we must believe the gospel, do not forget the truth that God is yet drawing you to a place of belief. Oh, God. He's drawing you to a place of belief. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Look what Paul says. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. Wow. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Glory to God. You see that? All right. Praise God. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse 4. It says, and that, and that he was, I'm sorry, verse 3, for he, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Glory to God. Now, Paul gives us an outline of what the gospel is. Now, when you look at this verse, a lot of people look at this verse and they see the if when Paul says, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. So when you look at that if again, you got to go back and apply that mentality or that interpretation of God, amen, praise God, concerning you, amen, praise God, because if not, you cannot see that if as in losing here. This is not a thing that if you don't do this, you're going to lose something. If you do this, you're going to lose something. No, that's not what it's dealing with. Glory to God. Amen. Nowhere in the Bible is it dealing with that. Amen. Praise God. Glory to God. Not when it comes down to salvation. If you get saved, there is no ifs. There is no ifs so you can keep your salvation. Once God saves you, once you are born from above, once you are born of above or born of the spirit, amen, praise God, born again, amen, praise God. there is no undoing that. Glory to God. There is no undoing that. So when you see those if statements, you got to understand that those if statements are not if statements as if it is stating to you that if you don't do this, you're going to lose what I gave you. If you don't keep doing this, you're going to lose what you have. No. Glory to God. Amen. Nowhere is those ifs doing that at all. Glory to God. Amen. So there is no if as in losing here in this particular interpret. Uh, when you look at this verse, you can't interpret it that way. Glory to God. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Because if you do, if you can interpret it that way, you just said that there is a contradiction in the scripture. Glory to God. And there is none. Glory to God. There is none. All right. I'm going to show you something about that if, if I don't get to it, I'm trying not to get too ahead of myself, but I'm going to show you something about that if, uh, I may not get to it today, but I'm going to show you what in this teaching about it. So just hold that thought. The next point is faith is not works of the law. Faith is is not works of the law. Glory to God. All right, so I want to show you this. Amen, praise God. So stay with me today. All right, look at Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 10. Romans 10, verses 5 through 10. Hallelujah. I know your wheels are turning now, which is good. Glory to God. Amen, which is good. So oftentimes, I'm probably getting ready to get ahead of myself because I just can't I just can't resist. Or I can't resist it. But <laughs> the if... A lot of times when we read those ifs, amen, praise God, we think God is talking about somebody who is saved, amen, praise God, losing something that he gave to them. You know, it's like it's like you think God is saying, you save if you keep on doing this. 
But if you stop doing this, you're not saved anymore. No, no. Because then if that's the case, you will be working for your salvation. Glory to God. Then salvation will be, a, then salvation will be the results of work. Amen. Praise God. And salvation is not the works of work. It's not the result of works. Amen. Salvation is the result of faith. What would be to God? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So you can't, so that's why, that's why whenever you see those ifs, you can't apply those ifs like that. Because if you apply those ifs like that, then you are saying that salvation is not of faith. Salvation is not faith. Salvation is works. That's what you're saying. <clears throat> We're going to deal with the issue of works. Amen. Praise God. Uh, because of faith. But I need for you to understand that many people are wrestling with the issue of works producing salvation. And works do not produce salvation. Glory to God. Amen. Not at all. So that's why you have to you have to interpret those ifs the correct way. All right. Again, I would I'm gonna deal with that some more through this series. Amen. Praise God. But that's enough for right now. Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 10. Look what it says. For Moses described righteousness, which is of the law. Watch this. That the men which doeth those things shall live by them. See, that's how the work of the of the Mosaic law worked. The Mosaic law worked like that, that if you do these things, then you will live by these things. These things will give you life. You got it? Glory to God. Amen. That's how the Mosaic law worked. He's, and the Bible, Paul said that's how Moses described the righteousness which came from the law, that the men which do it those things shall live by them. Because if you didn't do them, then you would die. Glory to God. Amen. All right? But... Verse 6 starts with a but. But the righteousness which is of faith speak it on this wise. So faith, faith, the righteousness that comes by faith speaks something different. The righteousness that comes by faith has a different voice. The righteousness that comes by faith talks differently, speaks differently. It has a different voice. And this is why I'm trying to help you to understand the voices in your head and the voices in your heart that arise when you read the scripture or that arise when you are going through life. There are voices that try to speak to you and some of those voices are not the voices, amen, praise God, which is righteousness uh, by faith, amen, glory to God. So the, 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 the voice that comes from righteousness that comes from the law sounds one way, but the voice that comes from righteousness that's speaking by faith sounds another way. And you and I have to be retrained to listen to and believe the speaking of the, of the righteousness, which is by faith, because it speaks differently. You may say, well, man, how can that be? Now, listen, I was a, a guy who was raised basically in a home where we were not Christians per se. Now, we were not church goers. We were not Bible readers. We were, you know, in all cases, you can say that we was kind of heathen. Amen. Praise God. We weren't religious at all. But I found that when I got saved, watch this, it was easy. For, it was easier for me, amen, after I got saved to respond or think I was responding to the law of Moses as it was easy. It was easy for me to do that, even though I was falling woefully short and wasn't aware of it, than it was for me to respond to the voice of faith. Glory to God. Responding to the righteousness which is come by faith and that voice, that sound that speaks, amen, makes you have to get outside of your own, any form of self-righteousness. Any forms of I'm better than you or I'm a good person or, you know, I can do this or I have been good enough or any inkling of that, any inkling of that, because none of that is true. None of that will save you. None of that will preserve you. None of that will keep you. Amen. It's an act of grace through faith from the beginning all the way through the end. This is what Paul is saying. So that's why I'm trying to help you to retrain yourself concerning that if and concerning that voice that's speaking to you. You got it? 
All right, Romans chapter 10, I, we, we had verse 6. It says, but the righteousness which is of faith, speaking on this wise, say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up uh, Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That means the moment you believe in your heart, the moment you begin to confess with your mouth, amen, praise God, because God has been drawing you to this moment, that moment that happens, boom, you are saved. Glory to God. You are saved, and it can't be undone. Glory to God. Can't be undone. Can't be repeated. Glory to God. No, I don't care if you backslid, if that's what you want to call it, you backslid and you went out and start partying again or whatever you've done, amen, praise God, amen, glory to God, you do not get resaved. You only be saved once, amen. Now, I'm not telling you that you don't need to repent of that. I'm not telling you that it's, it's, I'm, I'm grateful that all of those things are over in your life now and you got the victory over them. But guess what? God only saved you one time, glory to God. Being saved is not, is not a repeatable act. Once you get born again, you are born again. Once you get born from above, you are born from above. Now, the struggles and stuff that you may have gone through, the things that you may be dealing with right now, those things do not undo being saved if you have been saved. Now, that's if, that if is very important. If you have been saved, glory to God, amen. If you have been saved, because throughout this teaching, you're going to find that some point is teaching. I'm going to teach in such a way that you're going to have to look at yourself and ask, to, ask your own self the question, have I really been saved? Glory to God. Have I really been saved? Glory be to God. Because if you, well, once you get saved, you are saved. You can't undo it. You can't redo it. Amen. Praise God. It doesn't mean you can't mature. It doesn't mean you can't get stronger doesn't mean you can't overcome some things because we're going to be overcoming things as long as we're in this earth because we're not in our glorified body yet. So that's that's going to be ongoing. Glory to God. Amen. But you, it can't be repeated. It can't be undone. It can't be redone. It don't need to be. Amen. Praise God. Because God knows, amen, praise God, that you've been born again. Now, he also knows there may be some things that you need to overcome. We'll get to that. All right. Praise God. You got it? All right. Praise the Lord. What time is it? Okay, I got a few more minutes. Amen. Praise God for this morning, and then I'm going to have to stop. Uh, another section I want to show you under this under this number one point, which is, again, the number one point is, this, this first point is, salvation is done by an act of the Godhead and cannot be redone or undone once it is done. Say that with me. If you are saved, say, I've been saved by an act of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they saved me. And because they saved me, it cannot be redone, it cannot be undone, because it is done once and forever. Everlasting life, eternal life, not fleeting, not flimsy, not temporary. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. All right. Now, let me show you something here that I think is important concerning eternal life. Amen. Praise God. Uh, it's important to me. And I, 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 this, this part right here is huge to me. I, I hope you find it so as well. John chapter 11. Go to John. It's going to be my last part of, of, of point number one today. Amen. John uh, 11 verses 25 and 26. Go, to, go there with me real quick. Come on. John 11, 25 and 26. Glory be to God. John 11, 25, 26. Excuse me. My coffee is good this morning. John 11, 25 to 26. It says this. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Then he says this. Believest thou this? 
You may not believe this, <laughs> but I'm going to say this to you. Believing God for salvation, it is the most difficult thing you will ever believe. Glory to God. I know there's a lot of prosperity teachers and preachers out there, materialistic preachers and teachers out there, healing teachers and preachers and other type of preachers and teachers that focus on deliverance all the way here. They'll try to make it seem like you don't have enough faith because you can't believe God for your healing. Or they'll try to make it seem like you ain't, you ain't got enough faith because you can't believe God for your for your prosperity. Or you ain't, you ain't believe God for your deliverance from this, that, and the other. They, they'll make these points up. And most of them, when they're doing that, they're taking scripture out of context. I'm going to say that to you. Glory to God. Amen. You can disagree with me if you want to. That's fine. But I bet you can't prove me wrong in the Bible. All right, praise God. I'm not trying to be cocky. Amen. I'm just trying to stay on point. <clears throat> okay? Glory to God. Believe in God for eternal life. Believe in God for this, this, this eternal life. It is the biggest act of faith that you and I would ever do. This is why I made that statement. I'm going to make this statement to you again. Eternal life is the ultimate benefit of the promises of God. Nothing should suppress or surpass eternal life. Whatever comes or goes next, the glory of eternal life causes all else to pale in comparison. Glory to God. Glory to God. It, this is why Jesus asked this. He asked her here. He said, do you believe this? Amen. Her sin, her brother again, is not nearly important enough it's not nearly important than believing the fact that what we receive from Jesus, the moment we believe in him. So he says this, this thing of though he were dead, yet shall he live, and this shall never die. These things must be understood through the lens of life and immortality. It must be understood through the lens of life and immortality which was brought into even better focus to us by Christ himself. Glory to God. Let me tell you something. Until you really get a full focus of life and immortality that Jesus brought for us to have, you will always be running from one wind of doctrine to another wind of doctrine because you have never fully got settled and been becoming or in settled in the fact of just becoming child of God, of becoming someone that's born again. Many of you right now, many people right now out there trying to prove that there's somebody and they're running from teacher to teacher, from preacher to preacher, from conference to conference, and they've never ever fully been able to embrace and rejoice in the fact that they have eternal life now. Glory to God. And, and so it's like they got themselves on the little hamster wheel, the little hamster wheel, the little squirrel cage, and it's constantly spinning, glory to God. And they never have joy, they never have peace, they never have enough, they never have contentment, they never have anything, they never can find their ministry, they never can find their purpose, they never can find their meaning, meaning. they never can find consistency, they never can find anything because they're constantly spinning on this wheel because guess what? They never, ever, ever, ever really truly believed what they received the moment that they believed in Jesus. Because when the full impact of that hits your life, it's going to make everything else pale in comparison. Glory to God. And see, this was not brought to us in clarity like it is now until Christ came. Look with me real quickly. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Come on. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Verses 9 and 10. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. Glory 9 and 10. Glory to God. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Glory to God. It says, who had saved us and called us with an holy calling. Watch this. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. Ah, my God which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Verse 10, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who had abolished death and had brought life and immortality to light 
through the gospel. Until those things right there be, until we really understand, to the degree that we really understand the impact of those statements right there, you will constantly be jumping from ship to ship, from doctrine to doctrine, from wind to wind, going to your next level, trying to level up all this other kind of stuff you use, amen, praise God, because of works of your own works, or amen, and never really rest in the purposes and the work of God. Eternal life, eternal salvation, salvation is so powerful. It's the biggest thing that you ever will believe God for. It is the, uh, if you allow me to say that, it is the hardest thing to believe God for. Believing God for eternal life is harder than believing for your healing. Glory to God. I know the prosperity teachers and the, and the healing, healing preacher will tell you that believing for your healing is harder. No, it's not. Glory to God. Because until you understand how you was lost in sin and how you was bound in iniquity on your way to hell, glory to God. And then you begin to understand that God drew you out of what he pulled, what he pulled you out of, glory to God. And then allowed you to believe on you. When you begin to understand that, you won't let anybody make you question your faith. Glory to God. Woo, my God, my God. Hallelujah. So, so let me give you some things here because this particular text that we read in John chapter 11, I know in John chapter 11, we were dealing with the issue of um, Lazarus, amen, who Jesus uh, resurrected from the, from the dead, amen, literally, amen, praise God. But he made some statements here. He says, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he says, shall never die, amen, praise God. And I said it must be understood through the lens of life and immortality. Let me give you some things real quickly here that internal life does for you that most people don't talk about. When you become a believer, amen, praise God, <laughs> glory to God, you got to understand that the state of a believer in what is called death or what is called sleep, amen, praise God, because if you look at the New Testament, most of the time when the New Testament is talking about a believer that quote unquote dies, it refers to that believer being in a position of sleep, amen, praise God. But when you look at the issue of death and you look at the issue of sleep, amen, praise God, there are some things, amen, praise God, that believers need to truly believe, amen, praise God, or grow in, you grow in this in your belief, amen, praise God, that's valuable, that's a valuable part of your eternal life that's yours. This is why you can't let people trifle with your eternal life. You can't let people put you in hell one minute because they think you're a bad person but then say that you're a brother or sister when it's time for you to uh, put money in the offering plate. Amen, praise God. You can't let people do that to you. Because if you allow yourself to go through those swings, all you're doing is inviting confusion into your own life. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So let me give you three things, amen, praise God, that you, got, that you, that you receive. Let me give you three things that you receive the moment you begin, the moment you began to be a believer, the very moment you begin to be a believer and you have eternal life, which cannot be undone, which would never be taken from you. Amen. Praise God. Glory to God. Amen. Praise God. And it's only done once you receive these three things that's more important than anything else. Number one, as a believer, if and when you leave this body before Jesus come, it is going to be far better for you. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Far better. Now, I know many of you, amen, praise God, you think about missing loved ones and all the way. I'm going to tell you something. They'll be missing you, but you won't be missing them. Glory to God. Now, you got to, <laughs> I'm teaching up here. I'm teaching better than y'all saying amen. When you become a believer, when you leave this body, you won't be missing nobody. They may be thinking about you and missing you. Glory to God. But you won't be, you won't be having those thoughts about them. Glory to God. Because Paul says that it's far better to be absent from this body and to be with Christ. Far better. Far better than what? Far better than anything that's in this earth realm that you're in. According to the scripture. Go to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. I got to hasten in my time. My time. Philippians chapter 1. Glory to God. And look at verse, uh, flip, uh, what I'm looking for. 
get chapter one and look at verse 23 and 24 real quickly. Over to God. I got to get out of here. Philippians 1, 23, 24. It says, for I am in a straight betwixt two. So, you know, Paul was in that straight too. He was in that straight. And sometimes we're in that straight. And I get it. Amen. Praise God. But he says, for I am in a straight betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Oh, my God. Which is far better. He said, 24, uh, uh, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. So Paul gave us something here in this revelation about what it means to be a believer and leaving this body. He said to leave this body is to be with Christ. Glory to God. And he calls it far better. Glory be to God. He said, I'm, I'm betwixt. I'm betwixt. Amen. Glory to God. I know the advantage of me staying here with you. I got that. He said, but I also understand the advantage, the far greater, the far better advantage of me leaving here and being with Christ. So one point I want to make to you right now as a believer with this eternal life that you have now that you've received it is that to leave this body is far better than anything that's here. Glory to God. That is a guaranteed fact, a biblical scriptural fact. Glory to God. Number two, amen. When you, or if and when you leave this body and you're in sleep because of eternal life that's now yours, which can't be taken from you, which is not temporary, which is not flimsy, glory to God, which is not fleeting, when you do that, you are in a place of peaceful consciousness. Peaceful consciousness. Some people like to quote the scripture, amen, praise God, when it said that the dead know nothing. But when you look at that scripture, amen, praise God, in reference to the other scriptures, you'll understand that that verse of scripture is actually talking about, amen, praise God, that the Bible talks about how a person ceased to function as a functionary in the earth realm. But it does not mean that they seek to function as a functionary in the heavenly realm. Glory to God. In the heavenly realm, you have peaceful consciousness. Glory to God. You are not worried about anything in the earth realm. Because you're no longer part of the earth realm. So that's why we have to understand that Jesus brought life and immortality to light. Amen. Praise God. And he gave us more focus of it. That's part of your eternal life. So peaceful consciousness. Look at Revelation chapter 7, verse 16 through 17. I got to hasten here, but I love teaching this. Revelation chapter uh, 7, Revelation 7, verses 16 through 17. Glory to God. And I, I'm I'm just I'm gonna finish on this, okay, uh, for the day. Revelation uh, chapter, uh, well, I got one more, but Revelation chapter seven, verse sixteen through seventeen, it says this: They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat, for the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them into uh, unto living fountains of water, and God shall wipe away all tears. From their eyes. This verse is actually talking about the immediacy of where you are, of what happens to us when we leave this body. If you look at it in uh, which which I may get scans, I can break it out for you some more, but it may praise God. It tells us that there's no hunger, there's no thirst, there's no heat associated difficulties, which means that the you don't have to worry about getting older and the stuff that come along with that. You don't have to worry about the pains that come along with having to work and labor in this world. That's what I mean by the heat associated difficulties, the sun not lighting on you, etc. And then it also talks about no tears, no tears. You're in a place of complete peaceful consciousness. You're not crying about anything on this in this earth realm at all because you're in a far better, a peaceful consciousness. And lastly, because you have eternal life, something that cannot be undone something that will never be taken away from you. Glory to amen. Something that cannot be repeated. There's no reason to repeat it. It can't be repeated. It's done once because of your faith, faith that Christ gave you, faith that God gave you. He drew you to by grace. Glory to God. You have a place of rest. Rest. Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. Amen. You can read those for sake of time. I'm not going to read them to you this morning. But Revelation 6, 9 through 11, 
Revelation 14, I'm sorry, Revelation 6, uh, 9 through 11, and then Revelation 14, verse 13. It shows us that there's no wants, no needs, or infirmities of any kind, of any kind. Glory to God. Beloved, I got to close on this today, but I want you to, this is my first message, amen, of a, of a, of a, of a, like I said, this series is going to, it's going to take me a while to get to this series, amen, praise God, uh, uh, glory to God, amen, but I want you to know, amen, praise God, that, that, that when you, uh, when you get this, amen, praise God, in your spirit, it's going to change how you see things, amen, praise God, glory to God, it's going to change how you see things, glory to God. And it all starts from understanding what you have received the moment that you believed in the name of Jesus. All right. Well, that's my time for the day. I took a little bit of overtime this morning, but I pray that it was a blessing to you. I mean, remember, you can always email me at prophetfits at gmail.com, or you can message me on Messenger, and I would love to respond to whatever questions or questions that questions or issues that you may have. Uh, amen. Praise God. It will be my pleasure. So let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this great salvation that you've given to us. We pray that you bless us and strengthen us and that you will keep us as only you can. We thank you so much, Father, that you've begun this great work in us and that you are faithful to complete it. Now, Lord, anything and everything that's trying to challenge this peace that should come with us knowing because we believe in what we receive from you, we pray today, God, that you will give us the truth of the word of God that it would defeat those things immediately in our lives. And God, I thank you for doing it now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. It's my prayer. Stay tuned for part two. Amen. Praise God. Be looking for it, okay? God bless.